Welcome to the broadcast. I'm Adam Coble, and this is a RPG first look uh, brought to you by Evil Hat, by Strash Asimovic, and John LaBeouf Little, by Forged in the Dark. We're going to take a look at Band of Blades today. So Band of Blades, man, I am, so I'm really excited. I am part of, admittedly, admittedly, I am like the the, the t weirdo loser tail end of a, of a chain of really cool forged in the dark games that all came from John's original concept for, uh, for the Kickstarter. So John Harper, when he made Blades in the Dark, he was like, I want to make this game such that you can create your own thing from it. It has a framework, it has a timing, it has a cadence and a, and a feeling to it. And I want you to, as designers, I'm speaking for John here, I want you as designers to take that thing and make more out of it. Do neat things. Surprise me. Now, I have my own thing going on, and it's weird, and it's strange, but Strash, Strash just had to show all of us up. I don't think you know Strash well enough to know this, but on top of being like an incredibly helpful, incredibly kind incredibly talented designer uh they also apparently just churn out excellent games like that so strash strash has me has me shamed uh on having now two very excellent forged in the dark games being released in the time that i have written a very small part of one so damn you strash but thank you but damn you um so I'm really I'm really excited about this one. There are there are a few cool Forge in the Dark games that came out or are coming out as part of the Kickstarter. Uh, obviously, Scum and Villainy is the is the big the big first one. Uh, there are a bunch of games that are connected to it. Like we looked at uh, Mutants in the Mutants in the Night. Also extremely cool. Band of Blades is one that strikes a personal tone for me and one that I've been very excited about because. I really want to play it. Because I love the material it's based on. Let's let's take a look. Let me let me get my enormous face out of the way, and we'll take a look at Strash and John's actual game, and we'll let them we'll let them tell us a little bit about what we can expect from Band of Blades, and then we'll we'll kind of dig into it. So, this is the cover art, and normally, like, damn. Normally, I would kind of be like, all right, like cover art on RPGs is real hard to do. I'm really proud of the Dungeon World cover art. I've seen some good covers. I've seen some bad covers, but hot damn. Hot damn. This is a good start. And I just I know I have handled too many evil hat books. Because I can all I can feel it. I can feel that matte coating that that evil hat uses. I just like, well, I just want to. I want to get my hands on this thing. Um, so this is, this is, let's see, what does this tell us about it, right? This is obviously a, it's obviously a military game. We can see the big banner, the big spiky banner in the background. This isn't just a warrior. Uh, this is a person in a battle. There are corpses strewn about. Uh, there is a sword. We got a raven. This is grim as shit, but it's like, there's a kind of like baroqueness to it. I love the gold tones. Like this person, like this is, this is like, this is magic card level art. This is really, really evocative and really good. I, I like this person. It tells us so much about the setting in that it's down to earth and it's gritty, but look at her giant shoulders and her enormous skull hammer, right? This isn't just, this isn't just dark fantasy. This isn't just epic. It's, it's very metal. Yeah. And, and I, I think that this has a dirge like feeling, but maintains a kind of Baroque sadness because she's not screaming, Right? She's not yelling. This isn't mid battle. We are seeing the aftermath. This is this is the end of, of a thing. Not this is bad. Things bad things have happened. And she yeah, she's like she's mourning or she's she's like praying. This is a moment of of ashborn blood stained reflection. And I, I think that's so it's so cool. Uh, it takes what what could very easily be like aggressive. This is a game about war and shows us this is a game about war, but also like darkness about weight. Right. She's taken her helmet off. She's in a moment of of distress. I don't know. Did, did she win this fight? Did they lose this fight? 
I don't, I want to find out. I want to find out who this, this special lady and her raven friend are. Yeah. And this is just the right kind of shit for me. And it immediately to me screams Abercrombie, not the clothing company. Though if I saw this in an Abercrombie and Fitch, I'd probably be like, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. I'll come in and shop there now. Um, it's, it's like, it, it reads dark fantasy to me, right? It reads Joe Abercrombie. Uh, it screams black company, right? Which I have, I have talked about many times as being an inspiration for many a burning wheel campaign, but I God, And this is the thing I, I, I'm so excited about band of blades and I want bad of Bla band of blades to be so good because I don't want to have to stretch other games to fit that mold. I want this to be that game. And and having spoken with Strash uh, a little bit about it, I think, I think we'll, I think we'll see it played out. So what, what is, what is uh, the author? What do the authors have to say about this game? So I'm going to read this whole back text for you. This is the answer to the first question. What is this game about? And then we're going to spend the rest of the time trying to figure out how the game is about that. Uh, and, and what we, what we get rewarded for. So we'll look at the mechanics. We'll understand that stuff. So <clears throat> the road to sky dagger keep the Legion is in retreat following a failed battle against the armies of the undead. You are a member of the Legion, your bonds to one another forged in the dark by bone and blood. But time is running out as more fall to the indomitable forces of the Cinder King. As legionnaires, you must make it to Sky Dagger Keep before you're cut off or overtaken by the undead. I have the undead plague, excuse me. Blame the Cinder King. Paying horrifying costs, you'll employ offensive maneuvers, unwise bargains, and desperate gambits as the ever-ticking clock nears its final hour. Do you have what it takes to outwit, outrun, and outlast the endless hordes of the undead, or will your band of blades break beneath the Cinder King's iron fist? Play to find out in Band of Blades, a standalone Forged in the Dark RPG of dark military fantasy. Band of Blades contains all the rules you need to play. In this book, you'll find a clear game structure for playing out missions filled with moment-to-moment -moment danger and tracking the overall fate of the Legion. Rookie, Soldier, and five different specialist playbooks with Legionnaires created as they are needed when the casualties of war set in. Legion roles for all of the players. The commander sets mission priorities. The marshal directs the troops. The quartermaster manages precious resources. The spymaster gathers intel in the field. And the lorekeeper preserves the histories of the Legion. Three playable chosen. Humans imbued with the powers of the gods, each with their own unique gifts. Army advancement throughout the campaign, including gaining new materiel and the promotion of the Legion's troops. Four distinct heritages of brave and flawed people seeking to survive another night of the Cinder King's horrors. Join us on the road to Sky Dagger Keep. Our numbers are few, our supplies are low, and every operation is a deadly risk. But if any chance exists to make a difference in the outcome of the war, it is this cohort, the only remaining hope, this bloody band of blades. I got chills. I got chills. So it's like, you're fucked, basically. Notice that nowhere in there is it like, Win, win, win. Fight the Cinder King. You can do it. It's like you're screwed. You lost and now you have to get back. So this to me immediately screams like um, the Warriors, right? It's this like things are already bad. Tr try, try to get out. It's got kind of a survival horror bent. Uh, I love the, the, the phrase Cinder King is that's so good, right? So it's like. It's a war, a military war drama in the style of uh, Black Company. But to me, it feels a little bit, yeah, a little bit Warriors, little Banner Saga. Fuck yeah. Little, little org, organ trail. Yeah. All right. So that's what we are told the game is about. Military fantasy, Forged in the Dark, Band of Blades, some good back text. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to, I'm going to look around and I'm going to see if I can find... If I can find for me uh, the the reference material, I want to find like what you're inspired by. So here's the team. Big ups to the team. Good work, everybody. Uh, let's see. We got some acknowledgments. So these are games uh, that uh, that influenced the uh, influenced the game. Obviously, Blades in the Dark, Apocalypse World, Black Company, right by Glenn Cook. If you have not read the Black Company, they're great. 
um, XCOM, Enemy Unknown, Vermintide 2, and FTL. And yeah, let me let me just let me just for a moment as you percolate on those for just a moment. Writing good back text is so fucking hard because you have to give people enough information that they will want to buy your game. You want to give them an idea of what it is they are buying so that they don't feel bad when they buy it and they end up in another place, right? Where they think like it's going to be this thing and it's a different thing. And then also you just want to make it sound fucking cool and fun, right? You want to make it good. And it should, by the end of it, you should have chills. You should be excited. You should be like, I cannot put this game down. I have instead got to go over to Gary at the game desk and give Gary my credit card so that I can take this game home and then I can I can read it. So, yeah. So that's, uh, that's it's good back text. I like it. I understand what a challenge it is. It's a completely different discipline from game design. It's, it's, it's advertising, it's marketing. So I don't know who wrote that or who edited that, but I'm going to, I'm going to give Tom Lommel, I'm going to give Dungeon Bastard his credit here. Uh, Tom as marketing manager for this game. Good job. Good approval. You, you did it. <laughs> so let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at the game. Now, if you're familiar with Scum and Villainy, if you're familiar with Blades in the Dark, a lot of this stuff is going to structurally be similar. It's kind of like reading Vampire, then reading Werewolf, then reading Mage. There will be things that are the same because we're, we're forging these games in the dark. They're, they're based on this. And, and when we get around to it, eventually Womb of Night will have a lot of that same stuff. My intentional, my original goal for Womb was to make a book this size, but now I have these excellent games uh, to to hold me to to a standard. So we'll see. Maybe maybe I'll just pay someone else to do it. But you'll see a lot of familiar stuff uh, in here. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through every little detail of how it's different from Blades, but we're gonna look for the major the major mechanical stuff that's gonna set this apart. And I think it'll probably be pretty clear as we go through. So our headings are the basics, which is 60 pages of the game. Page one, the game. Good call. What does this game do? What do you need to know to make the stuff work? I think that most of this is uh, most of this is going to be similar to Blades, accepting touchstones, uh, some of the roles, discussing the setting, those things, right? So then once we know how to play the game, we make characters so that we can play the game. So this is going to give us our ideas about the different character types we can play, right? These are our, our playbooks, right? Heavy, medic, officer, scout, sniper, rookie, and soldier, right? Good. Okay. Then we're going to go on and look at the Legion, which I think, if I have to guess, I think the idea with the Legion here is that it stands in as the, it's the, the crew, right? So we figure out Legion roles. So our, our band of blades is the Legion and we select our Legion roles. The roles are commander, marshal, quartermaster, lore keeper, and spy master. And we're going to need to figure out what that's about. And then we get into the divine, right? Which is where we talk about the chosen and the chosen are the 10 who were taken. Is that what they were called? Yeah. The 10 who were taken in the black company, howler, shapeshifter, Stormbringer, soul catcher, the lady, yeah, yeah. So those are those are these, right? Our chosen. Uh, we talk about the undead. We talk about the Cinder King and the broken. Um, so yeah, our our big deal, our big deal, dudes. Uh, then the structure of the game, right? Our mission phase. How do we do? Uh, how do we actually go on missions? And what do those do? And then the campaign phase, which is our downtime. Campaign actions seems about right. So we go back and forth between taking missions, progressing the campaign. Then we go into how to play the various uh, actions of the game, which as we can already see are different uh, from, from Blades. Uh, we get into the behind the scenes stuff. This is like how to GM the game. We talk about fairness and horror. Uh, this is gonna be an important chapter. Um, and then we get into setting. And thank you for putting all of this setting stuff like nearer the back. Now, like Blades, like Blades at core, I think that the setting to this really matters in a way that it might not in a different role-playing game like Dungeon World or, or Burning Wheel because we're trying to get to a place, right? The Warriors matters not just because we are a gang trying to get home. It matters because we have to get all the way out to fucking Coney Island, 
right? That we are traveling through New York. So the world itself matters here. And I'm, I'm curious to see if the map and the mission and campaign stuff match up, you know? And I'm guessing, what is, what is the words? I'm going to just, I'm going to totally like, I'm going to guess. It's based on a Greek play book Anabasis. Okay. If there is not, if there is not a shout out, I, I will eat my hat if the touchstones doesn't have an Anabasis shout out at least. I have lots of hats to choose from too. <laughs> Uh, cool. All right. So the map obviously going to be important. We talk about the front. We talk about places that the characters are going to go, uh, and then changing the game. So what do we, what do we do? How do we make the game something, something different? And I'm, I'm really interested in look at this angry dude. I really interested in the fact that it says six player games here. So let's, let's take a look. Or we could just stop here and look at this badass tracker for the rest of time. Holy shit. So more, more really cool art. Uh, it looks like the game's gonna be black and white interior art, obviously color cover, um, good use of shadow, excellent choice for art so far. Look at her, she's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I love, I just love the, like, she's a tracker, obviously, right? So, yeah. Sick. All right. So, Band of Blades is a game powered by Blades in the Dark about the surviving remnants of the Legion, a storied band of mercenaries trying to survive and stop the Cinder King from destroying the remaining bastard of humanity. There are military tactics, bold missions, battles against undead, horrific magics, and soldiers fighting for, dying for, and caring for each other. That's awesome. That's so good. Uh, okay. All right. So... We get our setting, which I won't dig too deeply into, but essentially, humanity is in a rough scene... Gods, the gods have made the chosen to help them. These champions are imbued. They're, they're avatars of those gods and they ride out to, to do stuff. The Cinder King arose in the West and the gods were like, oh shit, here's a bunch of chosen. Five of the chosen were broken and turned to fight the Cinder King. That's the worst. I hate, I hate when they do that. When the necromancer Lord is just like, actually your divine divinities, they belong to me now. Um, this is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like an exalted when some of the solars get turned into abyssals that the, the abyssal exalted are inspired by the same material. You can feel that DNA in, uh, in both. So dark, uh, dark military fantasy, strong horror elements. The enemies you face are horrific undead. They are strong, deadly, and want to kill you. You have no magic spell to save the day. A game where mortality and frailty pay big parts. It's a fantasy world, but there's no dragons, elves, or dwarves. There's no prophecies, no wizards to craft mighty spells. It's a world where only solutions are blood, sweat, and tears of people fighting for their existence. So we're not going to have to answer the like, well, what if we just get 50 wizards and we all throw fireballs at him? Right? Military fantasy is akin to war stories of World War One or Two. War is hell. It is not heroes leading valiant charges, right? It's it's something it's something else. Uh, our technology level is late European Renaissance. Black powder is available. Most countries have muskets and muzzle-loaded pistols. That's cool. The nation of Or has made significant advances in alchemy and mechanics, but most of their findings are kept within the nation. There are no factories or large-scale production. All right, war is hell. We got guns. The Cinder King has turned the Chosen of the Gods against us, and we are trying to survive. I love it. I love games in which we play scrappy losers trying to survive. Now, it's a horror game, so we get a page where we, we talk about that, right? About taking responsibility for the fact that it is horror. Horror is broad. The themes in the book can be graphic. Take time to talk to your table about what is or isn't off limits, Right. Some people have no problem with any level of horror, but other people don't want a scene where like animals get hurt. Even though you're playing a game where humans get their limbs chopped off, you might just be like, you know what? We can have that happen. But let's let's take away. Let's move away from helpless things being hurt. Right. Talk to your players. Session zero. This stuff. It's a rule in the game. It says right here to do it. Um, so it gives us a couple of tools to use it. Uh, Bree Sheldon script change, which is which is pretty cool. Um, you can also use the X card or whatever other technique that you are familiar with. Uh, I think that's good. That's nice. Very helpful. Uh, and then it tells us the job of the players. One player is the GM. There's very little character fidelity, so you might be swapping characters. Oh, that's cool. 
So you play specific Legionnaires, specific Legion commanders, but you're going to play, you may play different characters on different missions. Oh, that's fun. Oh, I like that. Cool. Let's find out how that works. That's a pretty big deviation, right? So uh, you adopt two different modes of play. One is a role in the Legion, uh, which is Commander Marshal. We talked about those, right? Uh, three on the left are mandatory. Commander, Commander Marshal and Quartermaster you have to have. Optionally, a lore keeper and a spy master. Uh, and then aside from those, you play a few specialists and specific squad members. Rookie, soldier, or heavy medic officer, scout, and sniper. Neat. Okay. That's cool. You play the commanders and then swap to the grunts for the, uh, yeah, for the missions. And so you might not be playing the same heavy or the same officer or whatever. You might, this, God, I just like, I can see already the documentation for this, like creating a military flow chart of like who's in charge of who and like when you played what people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if a rookie dies, you get to play another one. And yeah, okay, cool. Fun. Uh, after discussion with the other players, the GM will select the chosen and broken for your campaign. They are the avatars of the divine forces and they influence the tones and themes. Oh, so it's like, it's like the, uh, the dragons in, uh, Ryutama, right? So like this campaign is a blue dragon campaign, right? In this game, your chosen will be... Uh, Shreya, a powerful wo warrior chosen by Bartan, focused on military action and strategy. And Shreya will be attempting to combat Render, a monstrous hulk and smith of armored troops. So our game will be about using military action and strategy to combat or participate in the depersonalization of war and totalitarianism. That's really interesting. Okay, so like a game in which it's Shreya versus Breaker or Zora versus Blighter, it's going to be different than Render versus Horned One. Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm curious to see in the correct chapter if there's a section for like making your own Chosen and Broken or whether they are like deeply, deeply set into the, uh, into the game's DNA. Cool. All right. So the game takes place in two phases. We do missions. The table chooses two missions to accomplish. One is primary, one is secondary. Then you engage, you jump into it. The secondary mission is resolved entirely with an engagement role. And then you switch to the campaign phase. The, U the Legion uses campaign actions to recover, pursue side projects, and advance towards Sky Dagger Keep. Hell yes, XCOM style tension meter, right? Do we... Ooh, darkest dungeon shit. Do we slow down and do we fix our gear or do we forced march on to Sky Dagger knowing that the next fight we get into is going to be harder and we might die before we get there, but we've got to push on. Fuck yeah. A single session is a set of missions and the following campaign actions plus some free play. A campaign is a dozen sessions or so as long as you make it to Sky Dagger Keep for one epic standoff before the winter. Once you reach and defend the keep, the campaign is done and you determine your score. <gasps> this is a game you can lose. What? What? Give it to me. Oh, shit. I want it. Give me that shit. So that's cool. So you there is there is a win and loss condition in this game. Do you get the sad ending where everyone dies out in the snow a week away from Sky Dagger Keep? Or, oh, that's, that's awesome. I'm into it. I want to know how that works. Uh, cool. All right. So we get some information about session zero. What questions to ask? Here are our touchstones. What do we got? All right. When you're pitching the game, Princess Mononoke, Seven Samurai. Cool. I'm listening. Game of Thrones, Battlestar Galactica, Full Metal Alchemist. Black Company, my hat is safe. Anabasis by Xenophon. Now, if it weren't for if it weren't for the way that copyright works on the internet, I would just play you We Will Fight by Battle Beast, but I assure you I will be listening to it afterwards. Also, if there isn't already a Band of Blades playlist on Spotify, somebody needs to get on that because I'm sure that we all know a bunch of like riding into battle heavy metal that we can that we can add to that list. So Spotify playlists, get on it. Let's do it.
<laughs> uh, cool. All right. So the game is four to five players. One will be the GM. So either the GM. Uh, so it's like uh, it's it's like mouse guard, right? Like there's some very specific like this is how this is how the game structure works. OK, so you have a commander, a marshal and a quartermaster and a game master. Right. Or you have commander, marshal, quartermaster, GM and a lore keeper or a spy master. I guess with a sixth player, you'll have all five roles. I don't know. There's a chapter for that. Let's let's we'll let we'll let Strash explain it to us. Yeah. Uh, OK, cool. So the core system is much the same uh, as Blades, right? You customize your tone. You use uh, the choice as to whether an action can happen or not. What your full, partial, and bad outcomes look like will help set the tone. It uses the same dice pool system as Blades in the Dark, which is to say, and I'm, I'll, I'll cover this bit and then we'll, we'll press on, but essentially you get a bunch of six-sided dice, you roll them. If the highest die is a six, you get a success. If the highest die is a six and there's another one, that's a crit. If the best you do is a four or five, there's going to be consequence, trouble, reduced effect. And if somehow you manage to best out at a three, two, or a one, that's a bad one. Bad things happen to you. And if you ever have negative or zero dice, you have disadvantage. You roll two and you take whatever the lowest one is. That's it. Everything in the game is that the most common results are a four or a five. The game, it's a game about partial success. And you use the traits that you're given in the game. You usually have between one and four dice, depending. So if you've watched, if you've watched um, any Blades like actual play game, uh, I understand that there is a Band of Blades uh, AP floating around out there. I'll try to find a link to it and uh, and throw it in the in the description. Um, but uh, yeah, this uh, you can see this this system in play. Uh, it's it's quite cool. It's elegant and it's got a lot of granularity. Um, I'm a big fan. I like it a lot. Uh, cool. All right. So we'll be making a bunch of different types of roles, action, campaign, engagement, fortune, and resistance. These are pretty standard blade stuff. Here's some cool people trying not to get zombied to death. And then here's our structure of the game. Now we talked about this a little bit before. The idea is that we take on missions and then we flow into the campaign. Then the campaign generates new missions. Then we go back to the campaign. And so we rotate through those, right? The commander is going to pick the mission. We play out the details of the primary mission. We gain experience. We resolve a secondary mission. We do bookkeeping. Play what happens at camp. And then time passes. Campaign actions advance and go back to new missions. So it kind of rolls through, rolls through the both. That's very cool. All right. So in this game, one of the ways to set tone with these uh, these sorts of games when they're based on another system is to create the the actions in the game to fit your uh, to fit your tone. Right. Like not all games are going to have the same stuff the characters are doing. So when you are playing this game, the answer to what do the PCs do? The PCs in this game consort. Discipline, maneuver, marshal, research, rig, scout, shoot, skirmish, sway, and wreck. Specialists in this game can aim, anchor, use channels, they can doctor, they have grit, they scrounge, and they weave. So all of those things are added to your, your normal list uh, if you're a specialist. You get to do specialist stuff, which implies that... that Regular grunts cannot do those things, right? Yeah, they work alongside general actions, and we'll learn a little more about them uh, later. Cool. All right. So base rolling stuff is the same. Uh, stress. You can push yourself. You trauma out if you get too much stress. These are standard blade stuff. Attacks that spread the unwholesome essence of undeath, like the bile of a spitter, give you corruption equal to the threat of the enemy. So this is something that's new. Corruption is like a stress track. And when you max out your corruption, you get a blight. So a level one blight, like boils or discolored eyes, are visible but concealable. Level two blight, eyes where they should not be, rotting skin. Level three is tentacle growth. Level four is... A conversion of the mind and body completely. Um, cool. 
And you get blight conditions as you accumulate corruption. Yeah, pretty, pretty Warhammery, little body horror there. Fantastic. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. That sounds very exciting. Right, and then uh, you drink to forget that you have an eye growing out of your chest. Horrifying. No, I like I like that this is this isn't just like again, if this were very Warhammery, this would be and this reinforces the statement earlier about characters that care for one another. Look at this scene, right? This isn't a scene of like, oh, I've grown a crab arm and I'm killing everyone around me. This is I'm I'm corrupt and this is horrific. But these other guys, obviously, like they're coming to check on you. They, they care about this person. They're like. We want to help. And she's like, no, I'm a, I'm a mutant. Get away from me. So it's it's the way that this art portrays the information that we just learned is an interesting twist on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Can she see out of that eye or does something else see out of it? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, right. So progress clocks. Excellent GMing technology. Right. Clocks to to track how far along players are in accomplishing things or how how long it takes before bad things happen. Danger clocks, racing clocks, linked clocks. They're everywhere. They're the best. Um, so the GM might make specific ones for this game for missions, right? Makes sense. How long does it take to accomplish something? How long before the mission ends? You can have multiple counters going at the same time. And in fact, I think for most Blades games, you you do end up in that position where you have five or six of these clocks going at once. So here's some examples, right? They're this game's version of Fronts, if you're familiar with Apocalypse World or Dungeon World. Uh, this gives us the base understanding of the roles, right? The player states their goal. They choose their action. The GM sets their position. And the effect level, get your bonus dice, Devil's Bargain is in this game, in the same thing, and then you roll to see how it goes. It's a nice flow. It lets you set up the expectations of the game without doing that thing where it's like you have to know what might happen, right? So basically you just say, I want this, right? I want to push this guy off the cliff. I'm going to skirmish to do that. The GM says, well, he's bigger than you and the, the ground is slippery, so I think that evens out. We'll call it risky. Set the effect level, right? It's great effect if you succeed because he'll fall off a cliff and then you roll, right? And judge the results based on that four or five, one to three, six plus critical, etc. right? Maybe he falls, but he doesn't die. Uh, maybe he falls and he grabs you and he, he yanks you over with him <laughs> and you both fall. Uh, maybe you push him, he falls, but he yanks your protective amulet off your neck before he plunges into the mass of, of screaming zombies. If you get a crit, maybe you push him and he lands on one of your enemy's uh, most important uh, allies, right? Maybe there's somebody climbing a ladder, an assassin is trying to infiltrate during the battle, he falls on the assassin, you get some additional effect, right? It's pretty classic granular success stuff uh, and uh, yeah. It's, it's a big part of why Blades works, is this whole structure. And we're, we're kind of blowing through this thing, but it's it's elegant, and it's good, and it's it's worth recognizing that there are a reason that games are being built on this on this structure. Um, cool. So here's another uh, badass uh, lady fighter who is having a bad time, um, but not as bad as everyone around her. And I really don't feel comfortable with how she's looking at me. And I would like to get out of here. Um, this book is just lousy with feisty murder lesbians. And it makes me very happy. But I'm going to change the page so she doesn't come and kill us all. So the game continues explaining uh, some of the deeper mechanics. Uh, like effects. How those work. Trading your position for effect granular details uh, that allow us to uh, fully utilize the mechanisms uh, of the uh, of the system consequences and harm we talked a little bit about and we'll we'll get into threat uh, later but uh, threat is effectiveness of tools weapons and resources right this is the the sort of quality of the things you're fighting um, so this is kind of like tier 
right in in blades because obviously there's no tiers of gangs uh there's threat instead right the whaler is a three a threat three opponent etc right how how impressive is your thing uh, whether that thing is a person a unit an enemy whatever uh and then yeah and then obviously because it's military there's scale as well it's a little more granular than tier yeah exactly yeah yeah so we'll we'll get into a bit of that later on so let's yeah let's carry on through this section um and we will get to Jesus Christ, seven harm. Get away from me with your liquefied or turned to ash. Uh, let's get into let's get into some of the uh, some of the the deeper stuff. So we have equipment. We got armor. More more good art. Some excellent haircuts on these characters. Uh, and uh, and then our fortune roll, our gather information. Again, a lot of this is just reflavored blade stuff. And then we get a good example of play. So I like these. Um, I'm I, I know not everybody is like a fan of having like detailed examples, but I still remember learning how advanced Dungeons and Dragons worked in second edition from the first couple of pages of like the fighter and the thief and the cleric exploring the the, the sewer. So I, I find these really useful. Um, and I guess they're sort of an extension of the, the stuff that we do in, in actual play, right? Like it's good to have a text version of this, but it's also nice to be able to see people play it, uh, which is a nice advantage that we have over the young, uh, t teenage version of me. I really like that you can see in, and I'm not sure if this is in, in, uh, scum and villainy as well, but I, I like that. And this is something I'd like to include in, in womb when we get there. I like that there is a PC versus PC section and that it shows the things that we as players of blades have learned, right? Slow down, talk as a group about how you want to go, right? How do you want to do this thing? Ask about the situation, like, can you be swayed into going along with my plan, right? Give everybody agency and then agree to live with the results, right? Bad results can be resisted. Armor is an option. The future is open to new courses of action. Yeah. So these are lessons that people have learned just from playing. Yeah. And Scum and Villainy has this too. Yeah. We're, we're learning. And part of that learning is the fact that that Strash and, and John were both part of the very early play uh, and play testing of Blades. So these are lessons that that we've learned and, and have gotten to put into these games as a result of, uh, of playing a lot of Blades and learning just how to do it in this game. Yeah. So here's an example of how the PCs might fight with each other. Uh, here is how we advance. We get XP. Let's see. So this is what the game rewards us for doing. Okay, you ready? This is it. This is the this is the thing. Um, so Legion advancement, character advancement. What are the characters rewarded for doing? During the game session, when you roll a desperate action, mark experience. Right. Blades. Review your playbook XP triggers. Right. Surviving the mission. Did you survive? Yes. Get XP. Did you not survive? Well, this is a moot point for you, I guess. So it's good. Just stay alive. The game wants you to stay alive. Your playbook will have a specific one. Like if you helped your squad through might or fortitude to help you overcome a tough obstacle or danger with somebody else, you get XP. Did you use your heritage trait? Right. When you use the mechanical benefit of your trait, all right, connected gives you plus one sway. So if you rolled sway to get information, mark experience. Uh, you might also bring cultural aspects into the story, swearing a Zimyadi blood oath or giving someone a Barton necklace charm. Memorable and poignant scenes will get you XP. Same thing, right? Uh, did you struggle with issues from your trauma? Mark XP. What is the highest threat opponent you face? So here's where threat matters. If the highest threat you faced was three, gain three experience. So the characters get extra experience for taking on difficult stuff. And yeah, you don't get XP for struggling from your blight, right? That stuff is bad. At the end of a secondary mission, any specialist marks two XP for surviving. Cool. All right. 
Um, in addition to the limits on a single ability, you can't have any more than 20 ranks of actions and six abilities. It's pretty rare to get there, but it might happen. Uh, your chosen can advance uh, after completing missions that earn divine favor. After earning four favor, the chosen advances advances and gets a new ability. So you kind of have your like, you have the party. There's a lot of layers. <laughs> you have the the legion, and the legion has a chosen and a bunch of soldiers. The soldiers can advance, the legion can advance, and the chosen, who is like your banner superhero guy, can also advance. Also, I want to know who these pointy eared Wolverine looking dudes are. I like that uniform too. They look very like Revolutionary War or like almost like Civil War. Yeah. So there's a bunch of characters. You play them. Yeah. Cool. So there's <laughs> that's that's nice. That's a nice flow of art to, to chapter, right? Here are a bunch of characters. What's the next chapter? Characters. I don't know who in the art direction of this game decided to put that art right before this page. Good work. Nice flow. Excellent, excellent work there. <laughs> so, uh, cool. All right. So these, this is, uh, this is our characters. We're going to figure out how these, we're going to figure out how these characters work, how we make them, uh, and what types they are. So, uh, the heavy, if you want to shine with might and determination against the dark, uh, the medic, if you want to get your fellow soldiers through a mission alive. Um, the officer, if you want to command your troops to victory, even when they're up against certain death. Um, a scout, if you want to see the enemy coming and always know what you're up against. Uh, or a sniper, if you want to dispatch the most dangerous threats from afar. Hmm. I would probably... I want to play all of them, and I, I guess maybe I could... In addition, there are playbooks for rank and file troops. They will always be assigned to a squad and five will be sent on a mission, usually alongside a pair of specialists. Play a rookie if you want to earn your stripes on the field. Play a soldier if you want to slog through the mud as a tough as nails veteran. Honestly, all of that stuff sounds fun. I kind of like playing like loser characters, so playing a rookie would be fun. It's the um the the mouse guard mouse with no cape. It's the tender paw, right? It's fun to be the character that like all you got to do is survive. If you're a rookie, just hold on. Just try to get through. Yeah. And I actually think I actually think that that's their XP trigger. I think I looked at the playbooks. I think the rookie gets XP just for like toughing it out. <laughs> uh, every playbook has a list of special abilities. Choose a special ability for your character. If you can't decide, just go with the first one on the list. There is a gender in the military uh, subsection. So this is cool. Um, because militaries and military fiction can be heavily male dominated, it's easy to slip into a mode of viewing these playbooks and the legionnaires themselves as mostly male. This is not the case, and you should feel free to create a character you find compelling without restriction based on their gender. The legion and the armies of the Eastern Kingdoms have people of every gender at every rank and every role. Now this is good on its own, but what I love is that first sentence, right? Because militaries and military fiction can be heavily male dominated, it's easy to slip into a mode of viewing these playbooks as mostly male, right? It's not just the bottom part, like the Legion has people of every gender. It's actually pointing out like you might just by accident because of the fiction you have been exposed to as a person and because of history and the way that history is portrayed in modern fiction, you might just assume everyone in the Legion is a dude. Now, the art is doing a pretty good job of making it clear that that's not the case, but it's nice to have it in text to say, like, we get it. You might do this by accident, but don't don't always think that. Right. Yeah. So heritage, your upbringing or place of origin, you are a Bartan, uh, close knit and devout, uh, an agrarian culture ruled by council. You could be an orite, cosmopolitan and influential, known for their technology Obsessed with nobility and lineage. Panyar from the deep forest, touched by an ancient god. Ah, uh, here we go. Everyone that spends enough time in the fortress, uh, forest gains an animal trait. Cat eyes, noticeable fangs. So that's a Panyar is what we're looking at right there. Okay, cool. Uh, the Zemyati, mountain-dwelling clans with a complex arrangement of oaths between clans and its members between a Zemyati and the world. Neat. If you want to play someone from a Bartan family raised in Zemya... Have fun and take Zimyati heritage traits. It's not designed for you to take 
The game is designed for you to take trades from only one, not to mix and match, but you can create custom heritage later on. Okay, all right. So generally pick one, but those are cultural traits. So you could be born in one place, raised somewhere else. You could be a Panyar who was raised by Bartons. You could be a Zemyadi who became an Orate. Yeah, okay, all right. Cool. And it's because it's mechanical, right? Uh, choose a name from the list or make one that fits the cultural naming pattern uh, and uh, and go from there. Ooh, looks. So this is this is a this is a Barton. Their heritage traits are warm. They get an extra rank of consort. They are pious, stoic, and educated. Cool. All right. So if you if you grew up there, you might look like one of these badasses. Uh, these are Orites, cosmopolitan with a variety of skin tones, hair, and eye colors. They often wear fancy masks instead of hats. They are noble, connected, vengeful, and stern. Cool. Cool. All right. I like the paper doll kind of like look. That's neat. So we can get a good look at them in different. It's like um, starting character tier one, tier five, that kind of thing. I start like that. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah. They're hereditary. They're not hereditary traits. They're cultural. So you can you can learn them. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. OK, cool. Um, let's keep uh, let's keep going. Um, oh, and also just because uh, just because someone asked in chat, there's a section here that says to help the next player picking up that character, you may want to make a note of heritage traits in the note so that if because remember we talked about these characters getting moved around, right? You may you may be the one that created this uh, cosmopolitan rifleman, but someone else might play them later. Uh, Panyar, uh, dark eyes and dark hair are most common. Most of them color their hair using bright hued dyes mixed with forest tubers. Uh, each Panyar has an animal feature. Uh, it's like the tell from, uh, Lunar Exalted or from Druids in, um, in Dungeon World. Uh, they are artisans, travelers, they are shrewd, and they are marked, so they're good at resisting corruption. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that. Look at that big person. Oh, their axe got bigger, too. Uh, and then Zemyadi. Oh, so that tracker lady we saw probably is Zemyadi. They've got this kind of like, um, like a uh, Norman thing going on. Yeah. Or like Norman or Viking. I love the long ax. Yeah. 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 So pale skinned and favor heavier cloth in their dress embroidered with gold and silver thread, uh, braided jewelry, uh, accent their dress with forged pieces akin to armor. They keep a small ritual dagger on them for swearing blood oaths. They are tough, bold, loyal, and stubborn. Uh, they have patronymics or matronymics, and their names are things like Cole, Freya, Isolana, Clarina, Sverena. So if you want to be like a uh, fantasy Nord or uh, fantasy uh, Slav, this would be the, the place to go. Okay, cool. I like it. I like it. Um, now, if you want a unique heritage... Some people do not absorb the customs of their birthplace, raised in unique environments, or find their own way. Um, as an optional rule, a legionnaire can choose not to select any traits. Instead, mark an additional rank of two different actions and tell people what your upbringing taught you and why. All right. So you can just be from somewhere else. Interesting. Okay, cool. So here's our summary. Playbook, ability, heritage, actions, details. At one point, the Legion was well-organized and regimented. Now shattered, practicality has taken over. And aside from filling the roles, there's little concern given to former rank. The exception is the officer playbook. They uh, still have rank. The marshal must acknowledge. So that's that's interesting. That's a nice way to make it so you don't have to fiddle over how everybody is like shaking out. You can understand. And I love, I love the idea of there being a former structure, but there isn't now. And so you can play a character who's like, no, 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 I'm not gonna, I, I don't have to listen to you. You were just a Sergeant, right? Everybody else is more practical, but that could be a character trait that you could bring in to be like, yeah, well, I still really care about the hierarchy, even though it's fallen apart. These sidebars are very good. Cool. All right. So we got our actions, which we talked about a little bit before. Specialist actions, loadout, 
standard stuff the characters might carry around with them. And this is all going to be things that appear on your on your character sheet, right? As you uh, as you grab the the characters, you make your characters. Uh, there are a few special items uh, like alchemy or right alchemy, which we talked about a little bit before. Um, but generally, the playbooks will have their own special stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh, cool. I was gonna say, is that a heavy? It looks like a heavy. <laughs> Cool. All right. So uh, I'll I'll let you kind of on your own time take a look at the at the character sheets and and g dig into the details of the ones that you're most interested in. I like I like all of them. Um, but uh, yeah, they'll all have they'll have special abilities and uh, and tactics that that lend them to their their various goals. Right. So we got our heavy. We got our medic. <laughs> I like that we have. Not today and Dr. Feelgood as abilities. I will say this. Um, one thing I like about Blades games and, and Apocalypse World games is naming moves. It's very, very hard, but it, it's super fun. And I love I love feeling the the names of the of the moves as a way to impart tone. It's pretty good. So this is the officer. Yeah, that's the officer. Uh, so the officer's got uh, a bunch of leadership abilities I kind of want to, it's funny, I kind of want to play like Cantor, Arcee, and Weird Boy. Uh, and I want to play them, but not as Blades characters. I want to play them as members of Band of Blades. It'd actually be really fun to play a bunch of different, like, mini campaigns of each different Blades game, but make the same characters. You know, like, it'd be fun to play them as, like, characters in this, play them as crew on a scum and villainy ship. God, God knows what kind of characters they would make if we played them in Womb. <laughs> Cantor would just, he'd just be a noble in Womb. He'd be like an awful, debauched noble. He'd be the worst. He'd be the absolute worst. You think he's bad now. So this is the scout. It's our stealthy advance unit. Um, I like that the scout and the sniper are two different things. That's cool. All right, here's our sniper. And actually here, hold on real quick. I want to see what you get experience for. So the heavy is the tip of the spear. They get help their squad with might or fortitude. The medic help your squad through medical knowledge or emotional support. Um, enforcing discipline or strategic planning. Uh, stealth or foresight. Honestly, Cantor would just be a rookie in this. <laughs> Uh, and then the sniper, keen observation or key shots. All right, cool. Oh, you've replaced your eye with an alchemical construct. Perf perfect, of course. Why wouldn't, yeah, why wouldn't you? And then sniper is also like two pistols uh, version too. You don't have to just be rifle, big rifle sniper. Um, cool. And then we have our rookies. You get XP when you stay out of the way and survive despite the odds. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so you just you just tough it out and don't don't get messed up. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay. Uh, all right. A day in the core. It's like a day on the farm. <laughs> Every meal a banquet. Oh boy. And then you can take an advancement where you're not a rookie anymore. You are promoted. You become a soldier. Gain a special ability and a rank of grit. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then you, yeah. Good, okay, cool. You must take this as your very first playbook advance. Then they become soldiers, and then we get to move them over to, uh, to the soldier. A hardened veteran when you help your squad through courage or determination. <laughs> Uh, good. Okay, cool. So these guys are <laughs> eat iron shit nails. When you push yourself, ignore all harm penalties. Hell yeah. I love, I love that you don't have to be like a special, not everybody has to be like a special, like, I think a lot of war, war drama does this where they're like, every character in the story has this really like special talent, cool, unique thing. I like that you can just be 
like a shitty soldier. You can just be like a hardened veteran or a, or a rugged uh, nobody, right? And you have to earn, you earn your way up. Not everybody is like a special superhero. And that's, that's cool. That, that helps for me reinforce the, the grittiness of the setting. Yeah. 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 So we learn kind of all about that stuff. And then, yeah, promotion is the act of gaining experience and changing playbooks. Rookies promote to soldiers. Soldiers promote to specialist. You take a special ability. You have to have the, you get the minimum starting actions. Oh, this is that Warhammer shit. This is that Warhammer shit right there. Look, so promotions, what? You must have the minimum starting actions of your playbook. That's good. That's very good. So, like, if you want to become a sniper, you have to have shoot two, scout one, aim one. Right, as your starting abilities. Is that how that works? Let me let me take a look. Because you can't, hmm, let me look. I want to be sure of this because I, I think that this is the thing where you become, you go rookie, soldier, soldier, specialist, and then, yeah, that is how it works. Okay, cool. So, not including the specialist action. That's why I got confused because aim, you can't have aim. So, you can play a rookie who hopes to become a sniper. Oh, that's neat. And then you get the bonus one when you become that. Because all rookies start with the same actions as soldiers, a rookie may always promote into a soldier. Medics are harder to advance into because you have to get that additional action. Very subtle. That's really cool. When you promote, transfer all your corruption, blight, trauma, wounds, and stress. For a soldier, you have to get specialist training. For rookies, you get not a rookie anymore. You get one new ability from your playbook and a level of the specialist action you promote into. Make sure to add... So... That's really interesting because you're going to be more like granular and interesting if you start as a rookie and then become a soldier and then become a specialist than if you just get inserted as a specialist to begin with. You've got some you've got some sauce on you. Yeah. And again, kind of calling back to my my callback on that is the Warhammer role playing game. But yeah, of course, it's an XCOM uh, callback as well. Yeah. So when you promote as a rookie, you keep your rookie special ability. It's a reward for having your rookie survive an incentive to promote from within the Legion. That is really cool. That's cool. Oh, I like it. I like that a lot. Yeah. Cool. So that's a good, that's a good thing. So yeah, you could get promoted or, or this could happen. God damn it. <laughs> 